I think one thing where we probably can have consensus is about what is the acceptable time to wait when you've ordered molecular testing and you have, let's say, a symptomatic stage four patient. Uh, I know when molecular testing first came out, at least for EGFR mutation, it typically took a month to get results back. So Anne, what, what is acceptable? Yeah. So the current guidelines are suggesting that two to three weeks um, would be an acceptable time to wait. I'll, I'll tell you that patients are on the phone calling you like at a week and a half. They want to know what you have. So I usually have a cutoff of two weeks for the patients that if we don't get the testing back or there's inadequate tissue, they have to get another biopsy and they're symptomatic, I will push forward to start with chemo if it's any time delay beyond the two weeks. And I think that two week uh, time frame also mimics the ISLC guidelines mm -hmm. that are coming out. Mm -hmm. Now, as long as we're talking about things where uh, there are various opinions, one very uh, important issue now is in a patient who has, let's say, an oncogene-driven cancer, at the time of progression uh, on an EGFR-TKI or crizotinib for alk fusion, do you rebiopsy the patient? And should this be for all patients? Can they acquire an EGFR mutation if they didn't have it in the beginning, or acquire an alk fusion, or just for the patients with those abnormalities? And I'll, I'll have Mark Sadzinski address this first. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great question. I, I actually think when you have an uh, oncog identified oncogene, that based upon our understanding of uh, patterns of resistance, that uh, I actually, in that initial discussion mm -hmm. with patients, uh, and we talk, talk about the use of, uh, you know, deviating from platinum-based therapy to a TKI, that, you know, this is not curative treatment. At some point, we'll be dealing with progression, and I would be likely recommending a repeat biopsy at the time of progression. Uh, we understand a little bit about uh, the mechanisms of resistance. It's not that we necessarily have um, great therapies yet for them, but for instance, the direction that you might go with the <coughs> primary uh, finding, which is the T790M mutation, might be a, a little bit different than if you're looking at MET amplification and that sort of thing. Likewise, in the ALK population, there was an interesting uh, ASCO abstract this year um, from the Colorado group suggesting that uh, there can be the emergence in the ALK population of other oncogenic drivers. Um, EGFR and KRAS specifically, so that might dictate your therapy in a slightly different way um, by rebiopsy. And so I, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate of rebiopsy in the oncogenic driving uh, population. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, uh, there have been data as well in EGFR mutant patients uh, that the appearance of new disease may even herald small cell. Yeah, I forgot cancer. And answer. certainly that would dictate a complete change in the, uh, the nature of our therapy. So for that reason, increasingly, I am doing rebiopsy. I think it should be uh, colored by the access to clinical trials. If a patient is unwilling to go on a clinical trial or uh, trials not specifically available, then I think the emphasis on rebiopsy, uh, at least in a community practice, might need to be downplayed a bit. But ideally, in the perfect world where we have uh, good access to these uh, clinical trials, uh, rebiopsy is probably imperative. In, in, in much of our oncogene driven population tends to be healthier patients and so you know, that was the issue of how risky is the biopsy and how likely are you to get to a sufficient material to do other testing outside of uh, the oncogenic driving population then um, you know would you rebiopsy a 72 year old gentleman with squamous histology at the time of progression I, I have to say that I probably wouldn't because as Dr. Sandva said before what are you going to do with that information? But it's really important to also um, make the point that we need to understand more, and the only way to do this is if we rebiopsy more patients, because we have to understand the natural history of all these different, more rare populations of patients, because we know each lung cancer is not the same. And so, you know, we need to incorporate this more as academics into our clinical trials where we add in rebiopsy and gather that information, and that's the only way we can move forward in this field. It should be an integral part of clinical trials uh, if you're exploring a novel drug in a, in a new population or, or a molecularly defined population, I think. So I was just going to um, 
temper a little bit the wonderful enthusiasm with the, the, the group here. Um, I think, you know, because I think I, I thought I heard Corey say that it's imperative to rebiopsy um, in, patients. In the setting of clinical trials. Right. So I think one of the key points, since the uh, majority of our audience is going to be in community practice and may not have all of those types of studies, many of them, of course, will and do very well at putting patients on studies. But I think that that's the key. And another point would be to potentially link with your local academic center to see what's available and who and where that testing is going to be done. Because if it's going to happen, it would probably be easiest if it was actually performed at or at least if the tissue uh, was sent to that uh, academic center that might have the studies as opposed to um, Sending it out um, elsewhere to another to another site, and so I, I I I that was the only issue because I the other questions are you know who's going to pay for a repeat biopsy? Does all all insurance going to pay for right. a repeat biopsy in this setting? I'm not so sure. But I don't know. you know, Corey raised the point before, and I forgot to mention this when I was chatting. But physicians should be aware of this observation of Dr. Sequest that uh, five percent or so of EGFR mutants emerge with small cell histology and they respond to small cell therapy. And so that knowledge should, in an individual case, if something just doesn't look right um, in, in the progression, prompt the need for a second biopsy because that's going to make a difference to sure. that patient. Uh, admittedly, that's a rare example, but you should be aware of that. But also in the ALK patients, we know that there are second generation ALK inhibitors that are very promising. Right. So if you have a secondary mutation, acquired mutation in ALK, versus a second you know, EGFR mutation or KRS mutation or whatever it is, that's going to dictate what you choose for second line therapy for those patients. Right. So I would argue that in the, in the smaller populations where there's an oncogenic driver, it is going to be crucial to do a second biopsy when they develop disease progression, because you can intervene. I agree with Alan that uh, over time, uh, we need to learn more, but we need to be cognizant of the various external pressures that still exist, and it really ideally needs to be done in a research setting. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not opposed to the repeat uh, biopsies, and it would, you know, the more tissue, the more information we have for various reasons. I always tell patients, though, when they're uh, attempting to make a decision about participating in a clinical trial, and they tell me that they want to do it to help mankind, I tell them that's very nice, but you should be very selfish at this point, and you should be doing it for yourself. And secondarily, if we benefit others, that's fine, but you have, they have to think about themselves as well. Well, this has been a, a great discussion. So as the moderator, I'll, I'll throw in one last analogy before we move on. And that's, I think, looking at the ALK uh, fusion positive cancers. And, and the data so far from both Colorado and uh, from uh, Boston, over 50% of the patients uh, have lost the ALK fusion mm -hmm. at the time they're rebiopsied after crizotinib. And in those patients, probably a second generation ALK inhibitor is not right. going to help. Mm -hmm. And so I would actually counter that at least for that population, the chances are so high that they may benefit from another type of therapy, including something like erlotinib, mm -hmm. if they have an acquired EGFR mutation, that it is, it is standard of care to rebiopsy them, or emerging standard of care. Uh, to my knowledge, all the patients with ALK fusion positive cancer that were rebiopsied and acquired an EGFR mutation responded to erlotinib. In other words, it's a real, it's mm -hmm. a functional it's abnormality. It's like 58 mutations. Mm -hmm.